acting on a Geneva agreement that was signed uh in <coughs> that was signed to be able to resolve this issue um invoked the court the international court of justice for a final determination in this throughout that matter guyana has been steadfast in making the court the determining party um the the jurist in all of this and has been prompt and um sustained its responses and applications venezuela on the other hand has refused to participate at one point, then filed memoranda at another point, and um, have been obstructionists in the matter. They are claiming, they claimed two things. One, that the arbitral award was a nullity, and two, that the court had no jurisdiction over this matter. The court decided to treat both issues separately. They said they would first determine the issue of jurisdiction about whether or not uh, they could determine this matter. And then they would deal with the substantive matter. Matter In um, last year, the court decided, determined that they had jurisdiction over this matter um, and that they can have a final determination on the substantive matter, which would be where the borders are. And um, in in that determination, has determined and given itself jurisdiction over the border issue of the two countries. Now, sometime this year, Venezuela decided that they were going to go to their people through a referendum to determine a few questions. One, to to ask the people of Venezuela to determine that the arbitral award of 1899 was a nullity, so that the court had no jurisdiction over um, this matter, the ICJ, and that Venezuela be allowed to annex Esequibo as part of its own territory. That referendum is scheduled to happen on the 3rd of December. Guyana asked the court in another application to say to Venezuela that regardless of what your referendum outcome is, you are not going to be able to, Venezuela ought not to be able to implement any of it. They cannot act on it. They cannot give effect to it. That ruling we heard today is going to be out on the 1st of December, which is January, um, sorry, which is Friday, the 1st of December. So in short, what we have before I come to the international reactions to all of this, what we have was Venezuela invoked a process in 1887 um, and asked that this border issue be determined, that the borders between the countries be determined. That was determined, and both parties agreed to treat that as full, final, and perfect. For 60 years thereafter, Venezuela treated that determination and the content of that determination as accurate. They took action based on that determination and um, did everything honoring the content of the determination, including treating with other countries as though the determination were um, in law, factual. It, any other claims that were made by Venezuela thereafter have not been proven, although many, many opportunities have been given to them, have not been, um, and you know, sometimes, proving is hard, but have not even been represented. In, in instances where Venezuela was given opportunities in the court, they refused to accept or take or avail themselves of those opportunities. And so that has been out there for the world to see. Um, the, the reaction to all of this nas it nationally is known. People of Guyana believe and have treated Esequibo all the time as though it is theirs. The government of Guyana funds uh, all the services in Esequibo, has always done that for, for all the time that we have been treating with this issue. Um, services like education and health and social services, transportation, food, all of that is treated um, and dealt with by the government of Guyana. Political parties in Guyana are known to be adversarial on almost every issue. 
the political parties in Guyana, opposition and government, have had consistent positions throughout the years on this issue. And that is that Venezuela belongs to Guyana. And in our claim and our reaffirmation of that fact, we stand together and have always stood together. There have been a few wild cards that might have used the opportunity every now and then to um, introduce domestic politics, but the political parties as political parties have maintained the unity on the issue, um, on the cause, and that cause being that Esequibo belongs to Guyana and will be defended and affirmed at every opportunity. Um, the CARICOM has been very clear in their position. They said as follows, and I'll read that for you. CARICOM insists that the referendum proposed by Venezuela has no validity, bearing, or standing in international law in relation to this controversy. The referendum is a purely domestic construct, but its summary effect is likely to undermine peace, tranquility, and security, and more in our region. CARICOM reiterates its support for the judicial process and expresses the hope that Venezuela will engage fully in that process before the International Court of Justice which has determined that it has the jurisdiction in the case brought before it to determine the validity of the 1899 arbitral award, which Venezuela questions. The Commonwealth has issued a statement also through its, its uh, Commonwealth Secretary General, Baroness Patricia Scotland, and they said, the Commonwealth stands with the government and people of Guyana and with our partners in CARICOM in expressing our concern over the questions in the planned referendum. And the Commonwealth continues to stand for the rule of law and reaffirms its firm and steadfast support for the maintenance and preservation of the sovereign and territorial integrity of Guyana and on, and on obstructed exercise of its rights to develop the, the entirety of its territory for the benefit of its people. We were also lucky to have the support of the Organization of American States with them issuing a statement as follows. We vehemently decry intimidatory ta tactics that seek to undermine the principle of good neighborliness. We recognize the right of Guyana to welcome investors. Guyana must preserve its territorial integrity and security by addressing its case with Venezuela. We've also had independent um, expressions of support and concern from other countries, the United States, the uh, Great Britain, um, CARICOM countries, and other friends and allies of Guyana. In effect, the world stands with us as we say that any contra controversy, any kind of question should be determined at no other place but at the court. That is not to say that Guyana is not prepared to speak to Venezuela on other issues of neighborliness. Um, or on other issues that we have in common. But on this issue, we are rejecting Venezuela's invitation to deal with this bilaterally. And we're saying the only place that this should be dealt with finally and fully is at the International Court of Justice. Guyana has a reputation for being a law-abiding state that has sustained its um, claims and, and belief in the rule of law, both locally, nationally, domestically, but also internationally. You would know that we have had to uh, uh, approach international tribunals before in our questions with Suriname, and we were successful. And we believe and are very confident that all of the evidence stands in our favor that would, would help us and help the court determine that Esequibo belongs to and has always belonged to Guyana. We suspect strongly too that Venezuela knows this, which is why they're um, unhappy with and unwilling to make the representation that they ought to be making at the court. We are rejecting the call for a bilateral resolution because we believe after a hundred years of being unable to solve this properly <coughs> between the two countries, that uh, it would be, um, it would not be prudent to try to do that now. The we have had very good relations with with Venezuela outside of this controversy, and even now the Venezuelan opposition parties 
um, are, are calling for uh, stepping back from the referendum and the effect that it could possibly have. So I'm going to pause there and Gail could come in here. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have along the way, or, or if you want me to expand on anything that we spoke about here, I'd be glad to do that too. All right, thank you so much, um, Honorable Minister Priyat Manichan, who is the Minister of Education. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, again, I want to sincerely apologize for joining the call very late. Despite my very best effort to be here on time, we had another incident that prevented me from getting here. So I want to thank Fardine for actually uh, picking up with this and running. And Minister, I sincerely apologize um, uh, for any breach of protocol um, that was unattended. And thank you so much. Uh, to the members on call here in Florida, I, I want to assure you that we totally understand um, how important information, accurate information is, particularly as it relates to a national sensitive issue as a Guyana border, a Guyana Venezuela border controversy. And you'll understand a little bit more why it's called the controversy. And the two ministers that are currently on this webinar here to help you uh, with that accurate information, I can tell you they are super busy from very, from very hectic schedule on a daily basis, going all the way into the into the late hours of the night. Um, they've been stretched out talking. Um, many times on many forums about this problem, in addition to their very substantive portfolios in the respective disciplines for which they held. So we're very grateful for them to be here, taking time with Minister Malichan. I know uh, just came back from a very huge graduation for the Sarapata College there. And I, was, uh, I think this has achieved a significant feat today. So congratulations on that. And thank you again. That being said, um, I would like to introduce to you um, our Minister of Parliamentary Affairs and Governance, a lady who is also very eloquent in the knowledge of and what she says and her knowledge of Guyana's history and bringing perspective into an issue like this is absolutely fantastic. So she's going to add a supplement, Minister Mary Chan, on this here. So, Minister, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much and good night to all the Guyanese in Florida as well as friends of ours who may not be Guyanese who are living in Florida and lending support to us. Thank you, Minister Priya Manichan, for presenting the outline of the legal case. The, this is a story of 124 years, a controversy that has existed long before we became a, a, a independent nation and for 60 odd years after we became an independent nation. So it's a long saga of controversies uh, that, in, that in, involved Venezuela who by in the 1980s um, had become an independent nation from Spain, and we were still a colony of British Guyana. So that one of the things that when you listen to the propaganda of the Venezuelans is that we are the aggressor. And first of all, the first thing I want to say that Guyana, as an independent nation, has always chosen peace, the peaceful means, and uh, in recognition and in compliance with international law. We are not the aggressor. We have not taken any territory from Venezuela. They took an island from us in the Cayuni, where they have a military base that is just a few minutes away from the border of Guyana. And that happened in the 1960s. We have never taken a piece of land or blade of grass from any country. We have been the peaceful ones, and we are the ones that have uh, complied with all the agreements, including the, the ones that have been outlined by Priya in her presentation. The 19, 1899 Arbitral Award, which defined the boundaries of Guyana, as well as the 1966 Geneva Agreement. And I want to just pause a bit on that 1966 agreement. One of the interesting things in the whole history of this is that the United States was on the side of Venezuela in the 1800s against colonial powers. Ironically, uh, how life and the history changes. But they, the point was that by 1966, just on the eve of Guyana's election, the, um, the, the United States, Venezuela, Britain, uh, were interested in making sure that the controversy, which by then, as Priya pointed out, with the, um, the, the Malé Provo letter, which gave them the excuse they were looking for in the late 1940s, and 50s to be able to challenge the boundaries, which for the first 60 years they had complied with, brought into domestic law, their own domestic law, as well as um, putting it on their maps. And so the, 
the the prior to our independence, you had a panel of experts that looked through all the documents as a last minute effort before independence to be able uh, to see if Venezuela had any claim that there was impropriety in the on the part of the persons in the tribunal looking at our boundaries. They found nothing. And then, of course, the Geneva Agreement came about because the different actors in the global stage, including Venezuela, wanted to make sure that there were options and me means to resolve the controversy, which Venezuela held strong to. The Geneva Agreement offered uh, several options and, uh, and is in place and has been in this episode and this whole saga of the, the options that Guyana has chosen, uh, which the UN has approved. And the final thing was, of course, going to the ICJ. So that the Geneva Agreement allowed for uh, various options to try to allow for agreement and acceptance of Venezuela of the land boundaries of Guyana. Um, in 1966, after independence, they created a mixed commission that spent over 900 hours looking at the documents, found nothing. Venezuela could not prove archivally from its records that there was anything in the tribunal award that was uh, improper. Um, we then had a period of, of really nothing happening and then you had the next stage was invoked, and that is the good officers process, which went on for 27 years from 1990 to 2017. However, in 2014, Minister Carolyn Rodriguez Burkett, who is now our ambassador at the United Nations, um, wrote on uh, based on the decision of cabinet to say to the secretary general at that time, which was Ban, who was Ban Ki-moon, that we had gone through this process for all these years and Venezuela was not moving, you know, was not complying and was not cooperating in any way with the good officers process and that we wanted to move to the ICJ. Ban Ki-moon as a secretary general then asked Guyana and Venezuela to give it another chance. And so in 2017, they started what was called the enhanced mediation process where the secretary general appointed his person to be the interlocutor and in 2017, the interlocutor reported to uh, Ban Ki-moon, who was on the, about to come out as Secretary General, that there was no movement whatsoever. Just to preface, the reason why 2014, the government chose under President Ramatar to call on, the, on moving to the ICJ was that this was the period when the uh, boat was seized that was doing uh, exploratory and seismic studies in regards to oil and gas. And so we gave it one last chance. We were compliant, again, choosing the peaceful road. And in 2018, when Guterres took over and the Ban Ki-moon supported the recommendation that we go to the ICJ. So the two planks, peace, legal process, international law, ICJ. The second area, third area has to do with diplomacy. Since we came into government in 2020, arising out of the elections and the fact that we had the support of the UN, the Commonwealth, the OES, the CARICOM, uh, individual countries in that whole process when there was an attempt to, to steal the elections from the Guyanese people and to, and to keep the former government in place, APNU AFC. We, Coming into office, we went into a very aggressive dipl diplomatic approach um, to build back the image of Guyana and to be able to ensure that we were not just playing in the CARICOM waters or the OAS waters, that we were going now to the United Nations and moving to a higher level with aiming to get into the Security Council of the United Nations. We also, and, and therefore our reputation as a country, not only because of oil and gas and, and because of our lobbying to get into UN Security Council, which we felt was an important protection for us as a country uh, in regards to the border controversy with Venezuela, but also wanting to go onto the global platform as an important player, partly because our ge geopolitical uh, presence was much greater than it's ever been before in our history. 
partly because of our positions on climate change, partly because of oil and gas. And so the diplomatic um, avenue has been heightened between 2020 when we got into office and now, and we're paying the, the rewards of that in that we are not alone as a country. We are not alone and we must never feel alone in this process. We have the support of the United Nations, the Commonwealth Secretariat, the OES and CARICOM as Priya read the messages from those entities. But the defense diplomacy has also um, been an important additionality and, uh, and been strengthened in the period of the last three years in terms of our neighbors, Brazil, in terms of United States and in terms of regional security. So we have become a, a more important player at that level. And certainly we see that in this uh, period of September to now with Venezuela uh, shaking the, the war sabers, as they say, the swords of war, that we have been strengthened by the support of not just the diplomatic uh, area in the general normal sense, but also in terms of defense diplomacy. Because we have to remember something that in this region, the region of the Americas, um, the Western Hemisphere, there has been no conflict since 1961 with the Bay of Pigs and the 1962 with the Cuban Missile Crisis between the Soviet Union and the United States. That is the last time there's been a conflict between countries in this hemisphere. So we have been a, a hemisphere, <clears throat> A region from from Canada down to to the tip of South America, we have been a peaceful a zone of peace, and it is very critical for the countries of this part of the world to remain that. And therefore, the international partners that I've called, as well as individual countries and countries in Latin America, South America, and including Caribbean countries, do not want to see any disruption of what has been our reputation as a zone of peace. And so these are very strong factors. But in addition to that, we have some new factors that have arisen that we must take into consideration with the, the Venezuelan uh, controversy. And that is that, first of all, we have since 2017, persons from Venezuela, migrants from Venezuela, Thousands of them are defend, descendants of Guyanese who fled there in the 1970s and 80s because of rigged elections, uh, returning home. Some of them now have grandchildren. Some of them are Venezuelan nationals and others who are returning home because they want to, they feel safer here. Things have become very difficult in, in, um, in, in, in the Venezuela, for example. And so the migrants from Venezuela started coming here in 2017 and were the subject of um, a, a sectoral committee of parliament review where the then Minister of Home Affairs, Felix, and Mr. Greenwich as Minister of Foreign Affairs were called in by the committee to answer um, to the influx of migrants from Venezuela and other countries and what was going on. So by now, uh, in 2023, it is estimated that the Venezuelan population here, or migrants from Venezuela, who are not only Guyanese, but those who may have been living in Venezuela from uh, uh, Dominican Republic, from Colombia, et cetera, are, have been living here. We have taken care of them from a humanitarian approach. We have offered and they have accepted uh, access to health and education in the COVID period. They had uh, vaccines, um, food hampers, whatever we were doing here, all the migrants of Ghana, not only Venezuelans, were able to access services free of charge. So that approximately 30,000 persons are here now who uh, came from Venezuela, who may not all be Venezuelans. But what is interesting in this period is the statements by, by Venezuelan migrants from Venezuela in their support of Guyana, in support of the territorial integrity of Guyana, the majority of them, and of course their desire or <laughs> to remain, Guyana remaining as it is without the Venezuelans seizing two thirds of its territory. 
They do not want Maduro to do this because this is what they fled from. This is what they ran away from in Venezuela and the hardships that they were encountering. So that's one new factor in the controversy that was not there in the 1960s, certainly not there um, up to 2016. The other new factor is the Barbados Agreement. Now, there have been several attempts over the years since uh, President Trump brought sanctions against uh, Maduro and the Venezuelan government. There have been many attempts, particularly by Norway, uh, to try to find some uh, accommodation between Venezuela and the United States, in particular because you must remember that Venezuela is the fifth largest producer of oil in the world. Um, and so there were very many attempts by Norway and other countries that failed. Recently, the, there was what is called the Barbados Agreement, which was brokered in Barbados, not by the Barbadian government, by the United States and other interlocutors with the Maduro government and the opposition in Venezuela to reach an agreement to start lifting the sanctions that Venezuela had been imposed, that had been imposed by the Americans and to try to relieve the economic situation of the Venezuelan people. But that had conditionalities and the conditionalities are very important to outline. One of which was that elections which are due in 2024 must include the opposition uh, parties, that they must be subject to uh, monitoring by international observers and that Venezuela must hold a free and fair election. In addition to that, it must allow the opposition parties to function and to be able to campaign and to be able to contest, which is not what happened in the previous election. And so that those are the conditions and the clear, clarity was that if there were any violations of these, that the sanctions could be reimposed by the Americans. Um, Maduro and the opposition leaders agreed. And of course, you see the first violation of the agreement with Machado, a female who um, has been, by a popular vote that she held um, with over 2 million votes, been able to be declared an opposition candidate for the elections and a presidential candidate. Machado hasn't got many, many differences that, with Maduro in terms of Esequibo, but she is very clear and has publicly stated that one, the, the sanctions, um, the Barbados Agreement will be threatened by the behavior of Maduro, particularly in relation to her candidacy. As soon as she was elected, the Supreme Court of, you, of the Venezuela ordered that they wanted to, they were questioning the vote that she got and demanded that the, all the ballot sheets and the tally sheets be handed over to the court. This is a major violation of the Barbados Agreement. And therefore, <clears throat> The, she is worried, it appears from her statements that she is worried that the sanctions, if they're reimposed, will make things difficult, one, for the Venezuelan people, but also in terms of elections being held in 2024. And so there's also the threat of the suspension of the elections in 2024 to 2025. You may ask then, what has this all got to do with the controversy? Because it does have a lot to do with it. When we look at the history of our country since independence, anytime Venezuela is having problems with uh, power struggles internally and who will be the presidential candidate, um, then they start to suddenly raise the Esequibo issue as a way of distracting and galvanizing popular support. We must remember too that the Venezuelan population from childhood in going to school are shown a map of Venezuela that includes the, the Zona de Reclamación, which is Esequiba, as they say. So children for two generations in Venezuela, who are now adults, are those that have, this is what they think, or this is what they've been made to think. And so the issue of elections, uh, Maduro has to also face the fact that there are 6 million persons who have left Venezuela between 2017 and now a lot of them in Colombia, a lot of them in Brazil, and in other countries of South America, including United States and including Florida. There are a lot of Venezuelans in Florida now. There used to be Cubans a lot, but now there are a lot of Venezuelans. And particularly the richer Venezuelans 
head to Florida. So that the context of the controversy and the beating of the war drums by Venezuela has a context of one, destruction of the population. Two, another issue that is putting pressure is the fact that the ICJ, and I won't go through all the details of the ICJ, gave Venezuela additional time until April 2024 to put in their counter memorial to show that their claim that the arbitral award is null and void, um, that they can, they can try to prove that case at the ICJ. We don't believe they have the proof. They have not proved it from 19, 1950s right through to now. However, if Venezuela has to go to the court and it is unable to prove that the arbitral award is null and void and therefore Esequibo is theirs, that will have an enormous impact on the elections of Maduro. And so the connection between the Barbados Agreement and what is going on with the controversy is important to note. And so today we have been hearing about not only the Machado yesterday saying that she is calling for the suspension of the referendum because it will impact on the image of Venezuela and impact on the Barbados Agreement. But also the today, there have been uh, a lot of uh, TikTok and other things saying that uh, Maduro may uh, postpone the elections to 2025. So there are a number of factors, moving variables that are taking place on this issue. Nothing stays the same and it is not the same as all the events that have happened previously to Guyana in relation to the controversy. The, there are new dynamics at play that um, were not there uh, 10, 20 years ago. The important too of um, the ICJ, as Priya pointed out, will be bringing the ruling on December 1st to do with our request for provisional orders to restrict Venezuela, not from holding the referendum, that is their right to have the referendum, but to implement or to take actions that arise out of the referendum that would interfere with Guyana's sovereign rights. And so we've been very clear, and President Ali said very clearly, we're not asking, we did not ask the ICJ for the, uh, for the court to stop the referendum in Venezuela. We have said very clearly, we expect and look forward to the ICJ supporting our position that, that Venezuela must not act in any way based on the referendum um, to interfere with Guyana's sovereign rights. And so we expect that on Friday, um, it is three o'clock the Hague time in the Netherlands. That is 10 o'clock Guyana time. And I think that is nine o'clock your time. It will be live cast. And I believe that we should all be glued to our laptops, or our phones to hear what the court will say. Arising out of all these things though, is an important issue to do with us as Guyanese ourselves. And that is, this issue has galvanized a, a movement of national unity and the reflections of national unity that we've not seen for a long time. And this is priceless and precious versus Guyanese. And, and we will hope out of this that we will be able to, to hone and to make this now not only about defending our territorial integrity, but defining us as a people and how we work and build a nation. And so, Priya has been very, very active in the educational system with the school children having many, many activities all across the country uh, with the flags and the map of Guyana and making statements about the love of their country. The David Martin's uh, trade wind song, Not a Blade of Grass, has become the national anthem in terms of this issue of the controversy with Venezuela. We may be a small nation, we may be not a military, highly equipped nation. And we may be even considered probably with Uruguay to be the little Switzerland of South America, because we've always cho chosen the peaceful path, the path that is uh, based on international law and the rule of law. And so, but what we have seen coming out of Guyana now is the level of unity between our people and a sense of who they are as Guyanese. Uh, their own identity as Guyanese. And this is, as I said, precious and priceless. So over the next few days, uh, we have 
on Thursdays, the continuation of activities uh, across the country, including a national stakeholders forum of expressions of national unity that will be held on Friday afternoon after the ICG ruling. And over the weekend, they, that will continue in different parts of Ghana, including on Sunday morning between seven and eight o'clock, the chain of unity um, in sometimes localized areas and others in districts, people coming together and do it in a central point, as well as the day of prayer by the different religious communities who have been having their different uh, prayer programs um, during this week, or Hindus, Muslims, Christians, uh, seven days, for example. And then on Sunday, um, they return uh, to the prayers. And then Sunday night, we have the, the patriotic reflections um, that will be held in the national stadium. And so out of bad comes good, but also too, we have to say that we have to prepare for all eventualities. We cannot sit there and be naive and say that, you know, well, this is how we interpret Maduro is playing Big Bad John and that he's just pumping his threat and, you know, his chest and banging his chest to look as if um, he is Goliath and he can do anything he wants. We can't be naive. We have to be able to prepare for any and all eventualities. And that's where the issue of the defense diplomacy comes in important, as well as the support of the international partners that we've spoken of before, including recent statements by the American ambassador and the British ambassador um, here in Guyana. So we're fortified. And I think that's one thing, the message, if we can say that to you, as many people um, are getting anxious, nervous, etc., and the rumor mill, this is social media now, and it, it has good uh, aspects and negative. Um, there are rumors about people fle are people fleeing from the border towns. Absolutely untrue. And I wish I could show you, I'm not technologically very competent, to show you the assertion of the Ghana flag on our border communities, Amerindian communities, in some cases right across the border, as you know, we cross a river at seven minutes, that in Ettering Banga border town, there are flags are all over the place. Same thing with other areas in the border towns with region one, region seven, eight, nine. And so the it is not true that people are fleeing the areas. It is not true. But we have to listen to the government uh, official statements um, and to trust those coming from the Office of the President, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ghana Defense Force as well as what may be statements by other agencies who have been um, given power to do that. We have to make sure that people are not being uh, misguided. The Venezuelan propaganda is a psychological warfare. They have a huge machinery that is every very often during a day sending out TikTok mis messages, and some of them are very horrible and frightening and um, you know, just debasing. And so they are willing to go to any end to try to intimidate our people. What is interesting is that um, our people are not being intimidated. They may be nervous, they may be worried, but they're not intimidated. You're seeing an assertion of uh, our love of country, our love of uh, who we are as a people, and beginning to recognize how many positive things we have going for us. Um, and of course, many challenges as well. So I've talked for a long time. I hope I've covered some of the ground and that we will be able to um, have questions afterwards that we can try to clarify. But one thing is clear, there is no doubt that 1899 Arbitral Award did not conclude the land boundaries of Guyana. One point in terms of the land boundaries, which I should have said earlier before I finalize, and I'm sorry about this, and that is that in the claim of the Esequibo by Venezuela, they draw the maritime boundaries. Now, the maritime boundaries were not done at that time, but the maritime boundaries have over time been calculated by the International Convention of the Sea of what percentage or degree you take off from where the land boundaries are. By Venezuela claiming the Esequibo, they claim the maritime boundaries starting on the left bank of the Essequibo, going straight across what would be the front of Demerara, thereby taking in all the oil 
rigs on the majority of the oil rigs that have um that are operating in Guyana. And so this is also not only about the internal politics of Venezuela, but absolute greed that being the fifth largest producer of oil in the world and having done that and mismanaged it so badly that their people were really suffering, that they now want to take on the, the oil industry or the oil uh, resources of Guyana by using the Esquivo to redraw a new line of maritime boundaries. So. The maritime boundaries for us start at where our land boundary is by the 1899 award. And therefore all the uh, oil companies that are operating in the oil industry out on the Atlantic are within our boundaries and in no way uh, uh, encroaching on Venezuelan waters. So let me just conclude on that and to say, we should not be intimidated. We should recognize that we are not alone that we have chosen the peaceful path of the ICJ and we are confident in the process of the ICJ that will bring an end to this controversy. It may not finish in 2024. It may not finish in 2025. It may finish in 2026 because the ICJ uh, is the, the highest court of the, one of the highest courts of the UN in terms of um, land boundaries, et cetera, and other issues. And so, um, this is not gonna overnight happen. What we're gonna have on Friday is a ruling of the court in regards to the provisional order we, we requested and which they urgently accepted, which was also very interesting for the ICJ to operate in such an expeditious manner on what is a provisional order restricting Venezuela. So I hope I made some things clear. I hope I've contextualized this and um, to open, to, to hear what you have to ask and, and to try to clarify further if there are any concerns and, and comments. Great, right. thank well, you I very much. I see two hands up, but before, before mm -hmm. thank, Gail, that was excellent, by the way. I just wanted to add one small thing. On Friday, we also, across the school system, nursery, yeah. primary, and secondary, school children are going to engage in expressions of patriotism. Um, and gain a better understanding of why we should feel patriotic about Venezuela, partic um, Esequibo particularly, and why we reject Venezuela's claim. It's going to be done in um, age-appropriate ways for nursery, primary, and secondary. I saw two um, issues being raised on the chat, and before I ask uh, or I let Rosalinda um invite the hands Roger, Ali, and James Burke up. I'll, um, I'll, I want to address the two of them. It's very important that we have been benefiting from international treaties. In fact, we were able to quote a few for you tonight. The Treaty of Washington, where um, we, we were able to engage in international uh, or in negotiations that allowed us to be recognized internationally. We were able to invoke the Geneva Agreement, which allowed us to um, use various mechanisms there on the to be where we are right now, which is approach to the court. We have been able to um, rely on those various treaties to uh, call on our friends and allies around the world for support, which we have gotten. And so it is very important that if we want to be treated with respect and if we want to be treated um, fairly in accordance with various conventions, that we ourselves don't breach those. And so the there are ways and laws and conventions and rules about how migrants are to be treated. And I'd, I'd ask us all to resist any kind of xenophobic kind of feeling. And I do understand why um, people may say send back all the Venezuelans, but we're not allowed to do that. We can't breach conventions and rules and laws and international norms on one hand and then try to benefit from them on the other hand. Nobody's going to pay attention to us. I think Guyana stands unique in having been steadfast in our observance and compliance with um, international norms and treaties and and that is why we've been able to benefit from the contents of those. And so we, we shouldn't, Venezuelans 
or persons from Venezuela who are here are from different categories. We have Guyanese who had fled there before, who are now back. Um, we have children of Guyanese citizens who had left and they are now back. And we have Venezuelans who had no relations with Guyana, but because we're close and the borders are, are, are well, the borders, we share borders that they might be in our country. So, and, and there are laws here that we must comply with regarding citizenship and um, local laws I'm talking about, as well as our international obligations for how we are to treat migrants. So I saw that as a comment that we should just send all the Venezuelans back. Um, I'd like you to understand the nuance about who the Venezuelans are and to also understand that we have seen from right here in our uh, borders, within our borders, Venezuelans who have repudiated the Venezuelan claim um, or persons who fled from Venezuela who are openly with their faces visible and their voices audible repudiating any kind of claim to Esequibo and declaring that they will not stand with that kind of claim. Of course, wherever you have a large enough collection of persons, you will have amongst them people that might be undesirables. And where those exist, we will treat with them as we do with any other person who attempts to break our law here in Guyana. Um, so we are, I think it's important that we understand we too have obligations under various international treaties that make us world citizens and we can't be uncivilized as far as we observe those even as we call on the civilized world to stand with us in this um, effort to reaffirm our ownership of the Essequibo. Thank you very much, Minister, for that. Um, I am seeing some raised hands and we'll get them. Mr. Hazelwood, I've also seen your hand raised, sir. So I will call you in a few um, in the order which we saw those hands. For those persons who also want to ask questions and then you may not want to voice it, you can actually type those questions in the chat box and we will read them out at some point during the, the, the forum. Additionally, we are going to ask you to put your contact details in the chat box if we want to give you information after this call or give you updates and programs and uh, you know critical uh, bits of pieces coming out of Guyana, we will have a way of contacting you. So I'm going to ask you, if you can, to please put your contact details. We will also put the diaspora unit's contact information in the chat box so you can reach out to us, all right? In terms of the raised hand, I've seen Mr. Roger Ali. Sir, you may proceed with your question. Good evening. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, thank you. I'd like to thank the ministers for their very eloquent presentations. I have three questions. The first one is, um, what should we in the di diaspora do to aid in this effort to thwart Venezuela's actions? And the second question is, what is the government of Guyana doing to prepare in the event that we have a military invasion. And the third question I have is why is the government of Guyana not using this issue to integrate the armed forces so that the burden of defending Guyana does not fall on one ethnic race? Thank you. And I'll take my answers off. All right. Thank you very much for that. All right. Um, don't know which one of the ministers want to tackle the questions first. There are three so questions. We have been clear. The, the president has been clear that we are prepared to, um, while we hope and uh, expect, frankly, that the ICJ's rulings will be respected and we believe that that ruling is going to say on the first that um, Venezuela is injuncted from doing anything with any kind of result it gets from its um, referendum so what that means is you could get a result people can tell you they want you to act, annex Venezuela but the, the court will say you can't act on that until we have we hear the substantive matter determining 
uh, the, the border controversy that Venezuela has raised. And so we expect that to happen. And, and while we hope that they will be um, compliant and they're going to be respectful of that, um, we also are going to be prepared. We have made no secret about that. We want, we will be prepared nationally and domestically. Um, we are going to rely on our allies who have already pledged support. You are aware that at this point, the U.S. is in the country. Um, as aspects of the U.S. defense is in the country uh, doing different things. We have spoken to and are in constant contact with Brazil, a very another neighbor that we have. And uh, they have also made some statements. And um, the president, even as we even as he is in Dubai addressing climate issues, is using the opportunity to strengthen our relationships with other world leaders um, and other forces in preparation for um, any action that we might have to repel. Um, right. Maybe I can come in here as well. Um, Go on, sir. Yeah, the first question about what the diaspora can do. As we learned during the attempts when elections were rigged in Guyana and even in the time in 2020 where there was an attempt as uh, the head of the OAS mission Golding said, the most uh, transparent effort to rig, to thwart the will of the Guyanese people in 2020, the diaspora's role in terms of talking to their members of parliament, their senators, their congressmen, uh, to, to come out and make statements. The UK diaspora was very effective in doing that. So were the Guyanese in the United States and Canada, for example, to get uh, to let their, their elected officials stand on the side of Guyana. And that made a tremendous, uh, had a tremendous influence. And so your role, of course, is to be well informed and to know what's going on, to know the history, but also to deal with your congressman, your um, senators, etc., in regards to standing up for Guyana and the prevention of any attempt to annex territory that belongs to a, a sovereign state, Guyana. So that's my answer on that issue. Obviously, the Miami Herald today came out with a, an article talking about the United States reimposing sanctions on Guyana and their, on, on, on uh, Venezuela, sorry. So that clearly these are messages going out from the United States, uh, from the media, et cetera, and uh, officials that they're not going to tolerate any kind of aggression by Venezuela against Guyana and worse yet, any type of annexation. And I think we have to take a global context of this just to step back. And that is that the world has now a number of uh, annexations taking place, Russia with Ukraine, Israel, Gaza. The world doesn't want another, and nor do the big powers of the world want another theater of war to open up. They saw that the failures of Afghanistan and Iraq, and therefore this particular hemisphere, as I pointed out earlier, has been the zone of peace from the failure of the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis with the United States and the Soviet Union. And so they, they, they don't want another theater of war to open up. This will have tremendous impacts globally and on their economies, on their cost of living, et cetera, they've see, as they've seen with um, the Russia-Ukraine war, which is after, what is it, almost two years now continues and we're seeing what is basically the annexation of Gaza. So with great destitution and destruction. So that it's not necessarily that they are uh, not participating in those, but they don't want a third or fourth or fifth theater of war opening up. The second issue to do with the military and what happens if there's a military invasion. That has to do with, with, if there is a military invasion, and we would hope that Maduro would not be so reckless to do so, would that, that the world is not going to stand by and just let it happen. I think that as we've seen with the reactions on the uh, invasion of Ukraine by Russia, as well as 
the very um, interesting developments in relation to global comments and opinions in regard to Gaza and what has happened with uh, the occupation or invasion of Gaza, that public opinion out there is not going to be sympathetic and governments have to listen to public opinion at some point. So that we, we can't say that that there won't be one, but we can't say there will be one either. It has to be examined from a, a range of political perspectives and looking at what are variables that could or could not make it happen. We have to remember too in Venezuela, the whilst um, they're using the armed forces, the National Guard and so on to traipse around with the Mapa Vesequibo on their shirts and, and uh, tramping through the city, the fact is that things are very tough in Venezuela and therefore Maduro is not totally sure that he's going to have all the response that he wants. Um, and so if there is, and God help us, there will not be an invasion of Guyana militarily by Venezuela. The consequences are not just going to be on the Guyanese people. They're going to be in the, the global context, the regional context, and obviously the Venezuelan people themselves will suffer. It will be not something that anybody that is sane wants to happen. You introduced in your third question a very disturbing question, sir. And it's the first time I've ever heard it. And it's a sad question, and I must be frank with you. To introduce into this issue of the controversy of border, controversy with Venezuela, an issue to do with race, is very hurtful for us sitting here, at least for me. When you see our army and our soldiers on the borders in the, in the last few months, and the president of Guyana going to meet all of them and to sleep with them, and the young, young people who are part of the army of this country, it is rather insulting to make it look as if that we have cannon fodder and only one particular ethnic group is cannon fodder. There have been many attempts over the years to bring other ethnic groups into the army, and that is slowly taking place. The head of the army itself, the chief of staff, is, is the Brigadier Omar Khan. He is not afro Guyanese. He is indo Guyanese and joined the army over a long period to rise to the position of Brigadier. And we're very proud of him, as we've been proud of Brigadier Mark Phillips, who is our prime minister, as we are of, you know, these are gentlemen of honor and gentlemen of integrity and has nothing to do with their race. It has to do with their military competence, their leadership and their integrity to stand up for our country. So I, I'm sorry if I'm being rude to you, I don't mean to be, but I'm really offended by any insinuation that race must be brought into this factor now. The young Hello, men and women who want madam. to defend our country respond, have nothing to do with race. Madam, can I respond? I think I'll there are other people waiting. I defer to the chairperson. Yes. Um, I defer to the moderator Ms. Ali. to decide that. Ali. And, I, no. I, I, and I would like to say that I've read the press and it's the when you read the press, I'm an objective observer of the, the scene in Guyana. And when you read the press, the PPP supporters, all they say is that the army, the civil servant, and whatever, it, bureaucracy is not integrated. My point is that if the army is not integrated, then are we not going to have a particular ethnic group bearing the responsibility for defending Guyana. And I think that this is a great opportunity for the government of the day to say, you know what? Every Guyanese have a stake and the military should reflect the demographics of the country. So whether you are, uh, um, you're offended, I'm sorry, but these are the realities. And you're so, a politician. Ms. You Ms. Ali. From the, Ms. 19, Ali. So from the 1960s, from the 1960s and the Inter International Commission of Jurists ruling to introduce to the British that the, the uh, militia and the paramilitia should become integrated. There's been an effort and there's a long history which we could discuss, which would be totally out of order and irrelevant to the discussion we're having today of why politically the army and others 
were not as welcoming to other ethnic groups. But under the PPPC, there have been active encouragement and inclusion and transparency in terms of trying to encourage other ethnic groups to join. And we are seeing that change taking place in the army and it is happening. But there is no statement the PVP has ever made in terms of uh, trying to not encourage people to join the army of other ethnic groups. In fact, there have been many, including the, um, the Commission of Inquiry of the Disciplined Forces that took place in the, the, and whose report was tabled in the National Assembly in 2010, made a, 164 recommendations regarding the security forces of our country, including issues of ensuring that the police and the army, the fire and the prison, that they abided by the religious cultural diversity of Guyana, including dietary introduction into the army and allowing people to pray according to their religion and their culture. This was not happening before. And therefore, it is not fair to say that there have been efforts, that there have been. And it's unfortunate that I don't think that the concept that you're bringing in on was ever raised in Ghana in the, uh, the view between September and now that it looked as if it was one ethnic group that was, uh, <laughs> was the one that was defending our country. Uh, it's unfortunate. And I'm saying it's unfortunate. And I've done there. Thank you so much, uh, oh, Minister. Much Mr. Mr. Ali, thank you so much for your concerns. They're duly noted. Um, but just quickly to add what the minister is saying there, when it comes to border issue, the government is very clear that it is a national uh, unification regardless of anything, basically. Nothing, is, and nothing else is taken into consideration. So thank you so much for your concern. We'll now defer um, the floor and we'll have Mr. James. Please ask your question. You're muted, so you may want to unmute. There you go. You're, you're still muted. You need to unmute yourself. Put your mic on. What, is, what about this? Is, can you hear me yes. now? Yes, we can. All right. All right. So here's the thing. <clears throat> My uh, question is absolutely not controversial, so don't worry about it. <laughs> it's about the dead man's letter. And I'm wondering if any of the uh, honorable ministers can address that. In, this, in terms of, has anyone ever seen this thing? You know, the actual real copy of it or a facsimile of it? And um, that's my question. Um, <laughs> it's not a controversial question, you're right. Priya is far too young. Um, and I, although I'm far older, I have not seen the actual document. I cannot say in the... Um, documents Venezuela has produced that there isn't a facsimile of that or a copy of it. Um, the issue that has always been thought to be highly suspicious is that Malé Provo was a junior lawyer in the Venezuelan uh, legal team for the 1899 award. And as Priya said, that he was silent for what is it, 40 odd years, wrote this letter that would be uh, released on his uh, death and which was, Ironically, before his death, he was granted uh, one of the top, uh, the, the top award of the Venezuelan government, and that was to be the liberator, uh, the award, uh, whatever they call it, of the liberator, or Simon Bolivar. And so I can't say I've ever seen it, and I, I'm not sure about Priya, but I think she's too young to maybe have been able to see that. But um, what we can say, sir, is that the thousands and thousands of pages of archives that were, were gone through by the panel of experts prior to our independence, the mixed commission that um, met after the independence um, and went through historical records going back uh, into the 1800s and earlier, um, did not find anything um, that would show that the, in, in terms of the claim by Malé Provo was that the uh, tribunal members cut a deal to 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 take away territory that belonged to Escribo, and that is what uh, we have learned and and seen in the uh, memorial published by Guyana to to the ICJ. That again, it makes those comments and and assertions based on historical records to show that they have never been able to prove 
that what Malé Provo said, and that was that there was a deal struck and improper behavior and propriety on the behavior of the of the tribunal to cheat Venezuela of the territory they felt that they belonged. One other comment on that, uh, Mr. Burke, is that um, historically in Guyana, if we just take our country, the shape it is, that the Spanish never uh, occupied any part of what became British Guyana. The Dutch did, the French did, the English did. And in fact, the, the most southern point of Dutch occupation, uh, when you look at our map, is in the area about 29 miles from Lethem, where they built a Dutch fort and where the Amerindian people revolted and chased them out. There is no such uh, um, presence of the Spanish conquerors in the 1600s, 1700s, um, and even in the Simon Bolivar revolution, there was no incursion by the, the Venezuelans led by Simon Bolivar or by the Spanish prior, prior to that into what was the territory known as the Essequibo. And so they're on very, very, uh, what you call quicksand on this issue. But Malé Provo was, I think, um, encouraged by certain elements in Venezuela who recognize that this territory is very, very rich and um, was rewarded for it. Um, but I can't say that, honestly, I've never seen the actual letter or the, a copy of it. So it was reduced into a memorandum and it is in the file. I, I can't yeah. see the original, um, but it's reduced into a memorandum. And what it really claimed was that the two British um, arbitrators were uh, in cahoots with the president of the court, but it only claimed that it produced no evidence, even within yeah, exactly. the document. It didn't say by doing X or Y or Z, or they met in this cafe exactly. and they had response. There was no evidence of it, even in that document. And I want you to remember that, uh, like I said, this was a very junior person. So let's practically apply that. A very junior member of this legal team is privy to a corrupt thing that he is seeing happening while his country is claiming land. Um, what would he likely have done at the time, gone to seniors and said something who might then have reduced it? None of that happened. Four to five years later, um, in the same year that they were awarding him with the Order of the Liberator, which is like our Order of Excellence, is the highest order you can get, he then says, well, I am writing this memorandum of this thing that happened four to five years ago. In law, there's this thing called contemporaneous um, evidence. And that is, if you see someone um, doing something, committing a crime, and you speak about it as it is happening, there is a, a lot of weight given to that because it is contemporaneous with the event. You and I know that we can't remember things with the same accuracy four to five days ago, um, let alone four to five years ago. Um, importantly, though, he has been, and Venezuela has been given repeated um, opportunities to interrogate this, to bring evidence, to prove it, to show that there was some kind of corruption that happened that uh, determined these borders. And they have been unable to do that. And so for me, it's important that um, it's treated the way it's being treated. You know, yeah. it's a man telling telling a tale from the grave. But also importantly, the, Venezuela knew about this and didn't do anything about it for 13 years. So let's say this is this big, huge thing that your border is now going to be affected. And this man says this in a memorandum. One would expect that they'd immediately act on it. They spent 13 years before they did anything about it while they had knowledge of this. Um, that, that he wanted it opened only after his death may well speak to, again, its credibility. I mean, if something this important is within, and you're possessed of this knowledge um, and you know about it, you might want to tell, tell about it right away. You might want to be yourself interrogated on this. Uh, the fact that you say you want to do this only when you're dead, so no one can question it, can be tested, um, are all very, very, very suspicious things. Great, thank you very much. We have Mr. Errol um, Hazelwood. Please proceed with your question, sir. Then we'll take from Monty and then Gittins and Igwell. I'm sorry, but I'm no disrespect is meant. I'm just calling the names as I see them on the screen. Mr. Hazelwood? 
Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Ministers. Um, I just wondered, though, I mean, uh, um, there was a lot of emphasis, which is which is good, on the legality and the ICJ and the rulings and the fact that it's not a dispute, but just a controversy. Um, uh, I think in the, in the Ancoco situation, basically, was a walkover. They simply walked over to the, to the Guyana half, and that was it. Is there any effort, or what is the effort beyond the ambassadorial level, for example, with the USA and UK? Uh, anything beyond that in getting a very firm and affirmative statement from the US, uh, which has a lot of interest in, in, in Guyana? Uh, of course, UK as basically the colonial uh, power that handed the problem over to the independent Guyana, and to some extent Canada. Um, in a more robust statement of support. Uh, because I, I think Maduro is way beyond looking at, I mean, he has claimed that he is not interested, that he does not respect or accept the ICJ. So that we can be legally on the right side of all of this, but I think he is um, willing to go ahead with fisticuffs. So I think that maybe there ought to be some demonstration of consequences that are, uh, you know, that, that that there are consequences to this Putinistic. So every every effort, and and I hear you loud and clear. Um, in fact, one of the questions that will be posed to the Venezuelan people on the 3rd will be to give the Venezuelan government permission to um, ignore any rulings of the court uh, based on the fact that they're asking for a position from the people that the court does not bind them and they have no jurisdiction over them. So we could very well be dealing with a bad man here. Um, all of his actions so far. Uh, suggests that that you know he may be desperate. I think it's their own political situation. I mean, it's very hard to go and ask people to vote for you in a national election when you can't feed them. It's a lot easier to tell them let's get together and fight for a border. Um, you know, it's it's easier to inspire some kind of patriotism in those in in those circumstances. And we have been very clear. We are mobilized. Um, our army is mobilized. The United States has troops on the ground um, that that arrived here two days ago, Gail. Um, two, two yeah, to three. A special days delegation, ago. yeah. A special delegation of special forces here, who have worked with us before, um, and are here. And we have no, no. Um, there will be no holes barred in the defense of our borders, and our people and our territorial integrity. And that may mean the reliance uh, on, on friendly forces and, and the collaboration with friendly forces. And that is why um, we have not spared through the efforts of His Excellency or any other senior politician who may have friends anywhere else, um, collaborations and engagements, even as we speak now, engagements that are currently happening with friendly countries that can be of support to us in every possible way. And I think even the the the, um, the 24,000 Venezuelans who are currently seeking refuge in Guyana, I think can be in some way mobilized to demonstrate their opposition to any such action. That, that, they that... have been. They so have they've actually... They've actually... They uh, have been. But the, the issue is that as all immigrant communities, immigrant communities, particularly those that are fleeing their country, just like our people when they went to the United States in certain times of our history, particularly those that were illegal, these, we register, we encourage all Venezuelan migrants from Venezuela, because they're not all Venezuelans, to register. And so we know the numbers here. So the 30,000 I quoted, is the numbers of those persons who have been registered in Guyana, 
receive extensions, some receive work permits from 2017 to now. Um, there may be others that are illegal and therefore they're encouraged to go to any immigration point and get regularized. Um, and of course, our intelligence forces are more competent. Guyana today is not Guyana 20 years ago or 30 years ago. It's completely different the level. In when they took on Coco Island, we didn't even have an army. Um, the army uh, was now being formed and, and, and so we were quite helpless. Today, we're quite different in terms of our cap capabilities and our intelligence gathering and the relationship we have had with Brazil. Brazil has been the big brother of Guyana for decades, regardless of which government uh, is in power in Brazil. Um, and every smaller country needs a big brother or big sister to be able to ensure, especially if the neighboring one is one that is claiming your territory. Brazil has been faithful on this and, and concerned all the time about any incursion into Guyana, um, because you must remember South America itself, almost every single country in South America has a border issue. They're not all of the ICJ, then not all of them have land uh, boundaries set already as we had in 1899. And so uh, what um, a number of countries are worried about is that if Venezuela takes this action, then it may open up their border controversies or disputes that exist in, in and along. And Brazil probably has the, the most in terms of because of its huge land mass. So the, there are many, as I said earlier, um, there are many variables at work um, that could change the outcome of what's going on. Clearly, Maduro is delusional, um, but that the world today and and Guyana today, in terms of its uh, of what it's been able to do, particularly with the defense diplomacy I spoke about earlier, we were never in this position before in terms of the strength of our defense uh, diplomacy, partly because in, in the 1990s, we're not considered a geopolitical Im importance. Today, we are considered a, a country of geopolitical importance. So uh, there are many variables that could um, change the outcome, could forestall Maduro doing things, and including what I spoke about, the reimposition of sanctions um, on Maduro, who violated um, the Barbados Agreement within a matter of days in terms of what they did with his own, um, what do you call, opposition candidate. And so these are things that um, are being seriously looked at and being given serious attention by the governments that we have called. United States, for example, Brazil, uh, United Kingdom, the CARICOM member countries, the Commonwealth member countries, the Organization of American States, and of course, the United Nations. And so it's in different factors now that are going on. Um, and, and so I think we, we have to look at this um, in a way that's not, um, that, that to look at the various moving parts, because there are many moving parts and could lead to different conclusions. If he went one way, that is Maduro went one way that was aggression and or if he decides to back down and to try to save face um, because he's gone so far out in a limb that even if he doesn't uh, do anything, he is going to lose face and will probably lose the elections if it were called in 2024. But obviously that's where the threat from the Venezuelan interest is that he could suspend the elections until 2025. And so there are a number of factors um, taking place that um, not all are within our territory. Thank you very much, ministers, for that question. Now, I know there were two persons who raised their hands um, earlier, but if you don't mind, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Egbal, um, because he indicated he has to leave and he had to go into another Zoom, so he wants to ask a question. So I'll ask your, your kindness. Um, Mr. Egbal, please proceed with your question. And Thank we'll you very much. Appreciative. Uh, thank you both, Minister, for your time. Uh, it was well appreciated uh, for you to explain so eloquently what is going on. I have two questions. One is, um, now that we are in the season of the Christmas holidays, lots and lots of people travel back to Guyana to celebrate the holidays. And um, my first question is, should we take any precaution traveling back to Guyana now? Um, and this, my second question is, 
this all resurgence of the annexing of Cuba by Venezuela, does it have to do with uh, the oil that we are uh, <laughs> drilling there? And uh, is there any possibility that Maduro might maybe looking for some kind of monetary award to get this whole thing settled? Has that ever come up anywhere? Is that in the thinking of the government that maybe this is what he's looking for? And um, uh, because of all the oil explosion we're getting right now. And I just want to uh, hear your opinion on that. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Um, does what, anyone can go first? I, at it. I've never heard of anything like that. Um, and, um, no. Um, no, there's been no issue of uh, horse trading with Maduro or with the Venezuelan previous governments in terms of uh, boundaries or in giving uh, uh, Maduro a SOP or some concession. Um, that has not been on the cards as far as I'm aware. And um, there are no records to show that that was ever discussed. Um, we have stood firm on our land boundaries being set by the arbitral award and that we continue to stay in that, that frame um, so, no. And that is why, as Priya said in the very beginning that of this discussion, that Maduro wants to step out of the ICJ process because he has to prove that the award was null and void, and he cannot prove it. They don't have any evidence to prove it. And the worst thing for any president of a country would have gone, in his case, is to go to the ICJ and present their county memorial in April 2024, when it's supposed to, and then get rejected in two years time, and that uh, the case doesn't hold. Therefore, this is part of the masquerade going on in terms of trying to find a way to um, come out of the ICG process. And, and that was his first move to come out, to say to the Guyana government, let's sit down and talk, let's go back to the the way in which we were doing it before in terms of the good offices or in terms of leave out the UN completing. Let's talk to each other about um, how we can uh, resolve this issue. And so, and we've rejected that. We chose the ICJ. We believe that is the place. If you say that the award is null and void, then you must prove it before court of law. And this is the highest court. So that um, that is not where, what uh, we are considering um, in terms of Maduro, in terms of any horse trading or sharing, um, giving him something to keep him happy. That's not going to work with Maduro. He's gone too far out on the limb, uh, much too far out on the limb. And in fact, and from a political point of view, as a political leader, um, has been extremely reckless and adventurous. Um, you know, for politicians, you're supposed to always leave a don't burn all your bridges one time. And he certainly burned all his bridges um, in terms of being able to save face and come out of a situation. Um, whichever way it goes, he's not going to he's not going to come out victorious. And Venezuela is going to suffer. The Venezuelan people will suffer, not only us, if he goes in a crazy way. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have someone by the name of Monty. Yeah, good night to fellow Zoomers, and uh, thank you to the two ministers for an excellent presentation so far. My name is Montague Congreves. I'm a Guyanese living in Florida, and I have two questions. The first one I think you answered just now, but it was about the 30,000 uh, Venezuelans in Guyana. I wanted to know how you actually arrived at that number, and you did explain it, but my concern is Guyana has very porous or relatively porous borders. And um, just like how those Guyanese initially left and went to Venezuela, I don't think they went by planes. They probably went over the borders. I mean, how do we know how many people that have not been accounted for that are coming over those borders? That's number one. And the second question I would have would be, assuming the ICJ will give a ruling that's favorable to Ghana, would that include the return of our half of Ancoco? Because I, I, I do believe that not fighting to get back 
the half of Ankoko that was seized in some way has led to what is happening today? And those are the two questions that I would have. No, I, I, the second question, Ankoko is not the, the critical issue in this controversy. Um, and that will be determined if our land boundaries are upheld by the ICJ and the claim by Venezuela is null and void and COCO automatically is returned to Guyana because it is part of the land boundaries of Guyana. So it was in the 1899 uh, boundaries that were set and agreed to in the arbitral award. So were that to be settled at the ICJ that the claim by Venezuela is null and void, automatically Ancoco would re would have to be returned to Guyana. The issue of the migrants is that the, what was, um, there's a post that someone put up and I really feel that it should be taken down. It's a very racist comment and it needs to be taken down. Um, and this is the first webinar I'm doing where I'm seeing this on the border issue um, and, and it's unfortunate. But to go back to the migrants from Venezuela is that the um, since 2017, the system was put in place, which we continued as a government. And that is Venezuelans were coming over, majority were Guyanese returning, were automatically entered into the system in terms of their registration, their immigration forms, etc. And whether they came through legally or illegally, they were all told to try to go to their um, immigration centers near to them, whether they crossed the borders, um, by foot, by boat, um, and uh, to go to immigration to check in to get their certificate or registration form, which would allow them to stay legally in Guyana, after which they would go and get extensions and work permits. And that is what has been in operation for all these years. So the figure that I'm quoting is quoting from the figures that are reflected in the documents of the Immigration uh, Department of the Guyana Police Force and the Ministry of Home Affairs. I have no doubt that there are those and there are persons who may be entering who have not been regularized um, as we have been encouraging them all to do for many reasons. One, of course, is a security one, as all countries would do for persons crossing the border. But in terms of being able to assess what are the available resources we have in terms of school population, in terms of medical care and health, et cetera. And so... So the figure we have, the figure we have um, is from the official sources, but I'm not saying that there aren't persons who are not registered. The Warao people who are the sister Amerindian group on the Venezuelan side with the Waraos on our side have our nomadic, unlike our people, unlike our Waraos, and they're crossing from Venezuela from the northwest end. And uh, they're nomadic. They settle, then they move, then they settle, and they move. They live a different way of life. And in some cases, they have to be, the police or immigration will go, will hear. There's a group that's arrived in a certain point from, from Venezuela who are Waraos, Waraos, sorry, I'm not saying it correctly, and will go and register them. But those are the groups that are sometimes hard to keep track of because their own way of life is one of being nomadic. Um, but we just have to deal with what we have to. Someone posted about sending them all back. Well, Venezuela, with all the issues of border controversy, et cetera, Guyanese went over illegally in the 1970s and 80s because of what was happening in Guyana. And many people settled, finally got regularized. Many of them were illegal for a long time. Many of them gave birth to children and had to bribe people to get the birth certificate of their children. They survived and they developed their homes in, in Venezuela. They made Venezuela their home. But because of what's happening in Venezuela, many of them have returned. And so I'll just give you a little picture, a memory I have, which may not be worth it. But when Chedi Jagan became president in 1992, the first country he made an official visit to was Venezuela. And I was part of that delegation with the then chief of staff who was Joe Singh. And we went to Caracas, we went through all the formal things. And of course, um, <laughs> the Venezuelans put up their map everywhere, which had the Zona de Reclamacion uh, on all the official maps, wherever we went. And of course, Chedi in his own way would uh, make a little comment. 
But we went to Bolivar State, which is the state bordering with Venezuela and Guyana. And we went to a town, which now I can't remember the name of it, um, very near the border with us. And we were overwhelmed by thousands and thousands of Guyanese who were on the road. The Venezuelan police confessed to us, but they had no idea that all these people were there. They came out with their flags, the Guyana flags, and they wept when they saw Cherry Jagan and the Guyana delegation. The organizers of Cherry's visit had put us in a small hall for maybe a hundred people. We had to run and, and rent uh, PA systems to go out on the road and the uh, National Guard and everybody came out uh, thinking that these people wanted to hurt the president of Ghana. And of course it was the opposite. I have, I always remember that meeting as one of the most emotional meetings I've been to where people want to come home, but they were there and they were grateful to what they were able to receive in Venezuela in the 1980s and 90s. But still, as they say, enable Stringberry, we're there. And so people wanted to come home. And in some cases, it's difficult to return home. It's not always easy. And we don't put pressure on the diaspora that they must come home. It is your choice and your personal choices. You have families and children and grandchildren that you have to take care of. But in this case, the majority of the, a large percentage of those who have come home are Guyanese or Guyanese descendants. And according to our constitution, if you're born of a Guyanese man or woman, you are a citizen of Guyana and there's a method of getting your passport, et cetera. Um, and, and so these people are not strangers. There are people we have a responsibility for, as well as those who want to make Guyana their home, that they flee, they fled from Venezuela for reasons. It is possible that things change in Venezuela and Venezuela starts to improve and the conditions of life improve, that the Venezuelans will, nationals will go back to Venezuela. We are not a Spanish speaking country or English speaking country, but as Priya said, and as I said earlier, the point is that the Venezuelan community here is behaving like any immigrant community. They're trying to find work, they're trying to survive, they're trying to have a better life for their children. And that is what all migrants have been and will be, and that is what our people have done when they've gone to other parts of the world. And so there's no reason and no indication from an intelligence point of view that um, that we have to you know, send everybody back home, back to Venezuela. That is not the information we have and that we feel emboldened by the, um, the, the number of Venezuelans here who have publicly gone on social media to defend Guyana and to even have their own little gathering uh, to be able to say that, but many of them were afraid to come out to the rally that they held because they still have family in Venezuela and they are fearful that they're being monitored by the Maduro government. So we 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 have we are humanitarian and, and we must remember that. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, is that okay, Mr. Monty? Your questions are all done. Yeah, that's fine. I Thank want to you. give an opportunity to the others. Thank you very much. We've got, uh, if I got this right, Gwyneth Gittins. Did I get that correctly? Roberts, Mr. Ro Gittins Robert. You did. I went to school with Gwyneth. Oh, look at that. <laughs> well, you can't see who yes, she is. Yes, I was mute muted. I am sorry. I look terrible. So, but Priya, you <laughs> never look terrible, Gwyneth. You've <laughs> always been gorgeous. Uh, you guys did an awesome job, awesome job um, explaining. And I do want to say that um, we have so many Guyanese here, especially in Central Florida. We have so many friends of Guyanese across um, Florida that are ready to help. Um, we have a lot of elected officials that we can tap into. Once we get the content information, like I understood things tonight in a way that I never did. And I could articulate it to where we could make this into a joke about Venezuela. And I think we have to do it in those manners and get content producers to, to do this story in that manner. But my main question to you guys too is, do we need to do this before the ICJ um, do we need to make a big deal before the ICJ or should we be waiting until after the ICJ has made a decision and then we message out? Um, could you guys guide that? I, two things. One, 
I'm a lawyer by training and, you know, we're not supposed to preempt courts. It might actually be contemptuous, <laughs> but I really can't mm -hmm. see how any court at this stage could make any other ruling, but at, hold on a second here. We're trying to determine borders raised by one country. One party has said, um, we don't agree with these borders and we want to change them. And we are studying that. We cannot for the court to allow any that that party to now come into a country um in breach of the same board it is trying to determine would be extremely um it, it would make the court's process extremely useless and courts don't do that to themselves because what would happen is any ruling made afterwards would be would be really null and void because practically the practical effect would be that Venezuela has already decided what its border is by moving in. So I don't see how the court could say anything else, but hold on, Venezuela, you cannot um, in any way give effect to any kind of decision this referendum has. I think the court is the court cannot tell Venezuela not to have a referendum because that is their right. And and we didn't ask for that. We yeah. asked for the court to stop the effect of the referendum. And so I think we'll see on Friday a ruling that says, um, Venezuela, you can't effect the referendum. Whether Venezuela complies with that is a different story. Having said that, um, so I don't think we have to wait on on the court because Venezuela has also been clear that they are going ahead with the Vene with their referendum. I think I think it is important to send a strong message from as wide as community uh, community as possible, from as many um, individuals and collectives as possible that. Uh, the world will not put up with this. I mean, this is, Yale alluded to a lot of it and did much more than allude. But if Venezuela is allowed to sit down and unilaterally decide that it's going to alter its borders to take in more land, then no country in the world is safe. And so I don't see how um, the world can allow that without, without commentary. I am aware that other countries are engaged in similar exercises and there has been unacceptable silence from an 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 accommodation from bigger players and there is that and it's a worrying yeah. thing but i think um if we were if if venezuela were to be allowed to just simply say uh we're going to take in two-thirds of guyana then what stops them from saying that regarding brazil what stops mm -hmm. them from saying that regarding any of the other latin american countries and so the the world's community is not going to allow it. Having said that, Gwyneth, I don't think we could hurt at all from okay. anybody and everybody saying, um, well, making commentary and doing commentary about it because you have your own community that I don't have access to. And you have, um, you spoke just now about making jokes. The 13-year-olds the and 15-year-olds amongst us are looking at anime. So we need mm -hmm. to do this differently so that we capture their attention. Um, the the okay. information sent out to classrooms across the country had to be tailored to um, the ages of the children. So we had to do things for nursery children that are different for primary, that are different for secondary. And that exercise really made me very, very conscious of the fact that we have to cater for every different, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the language has to be different to be able to reach our audience. And so if you can do cartoons or stories or music or uh, messages in any other form, I'd say go right ahead and tell us how we can support it. Awesome. That's definitely something I'll commit to and reach out to you guys um, to follow up with for sure. Thank you so much for that. And I hope you can drop us your contact details there so we can share uh, critical information there with you. Mr. Khan, please proceed with your question. Uh, good evening. Um, thank you, ministers, for um, enlightening us. Um, <clears throat> the more I listen to these kind of um, enlightenment, I get a bit more scared. Um, you know, a couple of things that you mentioned that concerns me that, you know, you rely on the support of the United States and, and Britain, two of the countries, to me, so they, 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 they lack the teeth to even stop genocide, right? To even have the guts to say, we abhor this. To rely on their support 
I think is naive. The other thing about that is, you know, Russia had sold some hard, military hardware to, to Maduro. So he's counting on, on that support. And, and two superpowers, you, you know, always find these third world countries to fight their proxy wars or to become the middleman in their proxy wars, right? So my two cents is this, please stay away from the United States, stay away from, from Britain. They have a record that speaks for itself. Look at Afghanistan, what they have done with it, right? I would more encourage you to lean towards Brazil, who may be a fair, a more fair broker in, in, and, and backer in this situation. Because we know, and you know, let us not be naive. Maduro has weighed himself way deep into this. There's no way of him to back out now. He can't save face by backing out now, right? He will do something stupid. This is how these dictators work, right? I can go over a list if you wish, starting with guys like Idi Amin and, 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 and those types. He's in that category of people. So he will do something stupid. So I think, you know, you guys need to reconsider your strategy because you may try to save Guyana by asking America or, or Britain for help. That help will come with a price. You will have to pay a price for that. And it's not only the people now will have to pay the price for that. It will be generations and generations and generations. Another 100 years, it will take the guy and these people to repay America and United Kingdom for any little bit of favor they give to Guyana. Thank you. Duly noted. I think it's it's a good time for me to remind you too that in June of this year, Guyana was voted on to the UN Security Council as a non-permanent member. Um, and we take up our spot there in January of 2024. The UN Security Council is the premier body established to maintain international peace and order. And so, you know, that might be a nice fun fact at this stage for for an understanding of our uh, friendships around the world. No, nothing comes for free. I be, I believe you too. And yeah, and I do want know, to also the, say the United Nations and the International Courts of Justice are you know political tools without any teeth. They are you know pretty harm. Uh, So I, I see your comments. We've never met before, but I've <laughs> I've very tuned into your comments on Facebook, and they're always very thought provoking. We are uh, speaking. In fact, just before I came on to this, there was a very um poignant picture, photograph posted, a single photograph posted with um the commander, the brigadier general, currently Mr. Omar Khan in a meeting with the Brazilian military, a single photograph on Facebook was posted. And I think there might have been a new re news release about a week and a half ago, showing that President Ali was meeting with the Brazilian president. Um, and there might have been a release. Did I read that? I read that, which means you could have read it too, that Brazil had sent an envoy to um, Venezuela to have conversations on this issue. Now, all of this is couched in diplomatic language, and Rosalinda is going to mute me if I step outside of that diplomacy, but I'm sure we could all read between the lines on, you know, the, the, at this point when we're talking about a very possible uh, further aggression by Venezuela, that our conversations with friends around the world is not going to be about purely diplomatic um, interventions. It's going to take into consideration realities that might see us being physically invaded and how that works as a response, not only locally from us, but 
but um, with our friends around the world. Thank you. I think that uh, they, we have said very clearly that one in my speech when I was speaking earlier about the, the diplomacy and defense diplomacy. Defense diplomacy only means one thing. And therefore that we have been working on that over the last three years and more so in more recent times. I also spoke about Brazil being our big brother. And, um, but we also have to recognize that politics is a funny thing and history is a funny thing. Venezuela was supported by United States in the 1800s against Britain in regarding to our land borders. And in the 1960s, United States and Britain were together in regards to making sure that Cherry Jagan didn't become the prime minister and the uh, in the in an independent Guyana. And then we have other controversies where we fought for free and fair elections for almost 28 years. But it was President Carter and the Carter Center that helped to, helped us, as well as the Belizean Prime Minister Musa, in terms of being able to turn the tide after a long struggle and many, many, many struggles by the Guyanese and Guyanese in the diaspora to have them pay attention to what was going on in Guyana. But that happened at the same time where the military dictatorships that were supported by the Americans were falling like flies in the different parts of Latin America and South America. But it was, we were able to get the restoration of free and fair elections with the help of a former American president and other former uh, other presidents in other countries. The, these are the ironies and the contradictions that we face in politics. And then again, of course, we had the most recent one of all in 2020, that these same countries, individual countries, supported Guyana in the fight to prevail, to, to protect democracy and to ensure that the vote of the Guyanese people was not stolen by the former government, but that the, the vote reflected the reality of, of what happened on in the elections in March. So these are the contradictions that we have. We're not saying that any country should or should not be, but politics and, and, and reality is that we have to have, sometimes our friends are our friends and sometimes our friends are our enemies. It has to do with also our real politic. This is our struggle. It's our in in, uh, integrity. It is our territorial integrity. And we will have to, and we do have to, work with partners in the international regional levels to ensure that our people are safe, that our country is safe, and that our nation is able to, to, to continue. Because if Venezuela does what it's threatening, Ghana will be a sliver of a country um, the guy, as we know, it will not exist. Do we? What do we do as politicians? What do we do as leaders? What do we do as people and the Guyanese people themselves? Do we sit there and say, well, these persons are not nice and these persons are not this and these persons are not, and, and just sit there? We can't. We have a duty and obligation, a moral duty and obligation to our people and to our nation to protect them. And therefore, we will have friends. And some friends would have been enemies before. And some friends who may become enemies that were friends before. So, I mean, please, we, we have a responsibility. This is not an issue that becomes a big ideological battle. This is what Venezuela wants to make it is an ideological battle. Maduro goes around saying all the time that the, uh, the, the Ghana is an Exxon country, that Ghana is controlled by Exxon, that the politicians, in Ghana are in the back pocket of Exxon. And this is the imperialism that he is fighting against. What, what we have to be careful not to have the, 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 what do you call the opposite argument of that. So we can be purist. I wish all my life as a politician that I could be a purist. Unfortunately, I haven't been. I must confess my sins. I have not been because reality makes you make decisions for what? For the people, for the country, for our, for who we are. And this is the juncture we're at now. This is the political juncture of Guyana right now, where it is country and including all of Guyana, the whole of Guyana, 
is at stake. And therefore we have responsibility to ensure and to take as many measures as we can to forestall anything that would hurt our country, hurt our people and, and destroy our nation as we know it. And so the issue of um, using diplomacy in the broadest sense and the interlocutors at many levels, talking to Maduro, talking to the Americans, talking to the British, talking to the Canadians, or whoever, Brazilians and Colombians. The former president of Colombia, Duke, has come out calling on Venezuela to not do anything and to stand with Guyana. This was not the case years ago. This was not the case years ago. Many of the Latin American and South American countries supported Venezuela. Things have changed. So don't, I don't want to, to, to appear to be uh, lecturing, but I'm just trying to say that nothing is black and white. Nothing is black and white. Politics is about the much, the range of colors that deal with the grays and the dark grays and the pale whites and the pink whites and whatever you call it. It's a range of colors. And that is, that's the reality what, what we have to do as a nation we are, we cannot be found failing our people and our nation at this time. And therefore we will talk to countries to stand with <laughs> and to support us. <clears throat> and yes, there may be consequences. They always are. But, you know, there are also consequences for many things and not all of it has to do with um, what we may assume. And so, I, I am not worried that if the a particular country is supporting us with defense strategy and planning and or another country is strengthening their borders, um, like Brazil, for example, that they're going to, that we have to pay some pot of gold or made some big ideological concession. We have not done that. And I don't see us doing that on these issues. Um, so I, I think that we, all I'm saying in a very long-winded, sorry um, uh, way, is that politics is not clear ever, black and white, never one that's simple and always one that demands the political leaders of a country to make tough decisions on what is the best interest of their country. And hopefully that history will find them <laughs> having done the right thing but you can only in the moment make what is the right decision for your people. Right. President Thank you. Chavez was here, I think it was around 208, 209, somewhere around there. And he had said at the time, not that they were giving up the claim to the S Quibble, but mm -hmm. that it would be on the back burner because yep. it was an imperialist ploy, um, the entire issue, to, and that, that he was shelving it. As president and the current opposition person now in Venezuela, Maria um, Machado. Machado Machado is is saying again, not that she doesn't believe in in the people's claim, bearing in mind that Venezuelans were taught this from nursery all the way up into their adulthood, but that she did not believe that this was something that should be pursued now and that the referendum should be suspended. So um, they're not not everybody is our enemy and we might have differences on particular issues and we're never shy to say those as you know um, we've never been shy in um, proclaiming friendships with persons that uh, big powers might not be friendly with and 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 staying close and having relations with with various countries but I think as Gail said what would be the point now of um, refusing to speak to any country or any power uh, if that refusal would mean that we run the risk of not having um, the power to speak to them anymore. Um, if we were to lose our, our own sovereignty and, and, and power, not only political power, but state power. And so I, I, do know and I like I said I follow you I I see your posts on Facebook and they're really thought provoking especially regarding you know the current um problems 
in 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 Gaza. And so I know where your positions are coming from. Great. Thank you so much. We want to uh, bring the curtains down to this at Rosalind, could I just Rosalind? I don't want to go back to the issue. I want to read something that someone sure. sent me from a border town, a border area. Um, Certainly, go ahead. With with Venezuela. Um, just to give you an idea of people living on the border, what they feel and what they think. Um, this is a WhatsApp message I got at 10.02 from a border area, which I will not name for obvious reasons. Giving a big thank you to the GDF for their commitments and assistance in the area, especially to so-and-so, I will not raise the name of the officer in charge, who is here making sure residents feel safe. There will be a flag raising ceremony tomorrow morning at the primary school. Hope to see you there to honor our country. We love our country. We love our flag. The Diana flag is flying high over the area. So I'm just want to give you a sense of this is tonight someone sending from a rather delicate and sensitive border area. What is her appreciation of the GDF and her own views of it, that the the uh, of our beloved nation, and so I think it's not a bad time to stop on that or to close on that. That uh, people, the people can very pragmatically, as in other areas, say, "Well, where do I go? This is my home. This is where I am. This is where I live." And so, the the presence of the GDF has helped communities along the border, and they are not ungrateful for that. They are they are they feel more secure with the presence of the Ghana Defense Force. And, and for persons, because I saw some of the commentary, um, for the persons who are, and, and I, your, your sentiments may well be coming from a position of sympathy. But let me say this, as the wife of a soldier, I, I know these uh, servicemen have lived their entire lives in service almost in preparation for this. And they are deeply honored to be able to do this for us. Um, they feel purposeful. And I know because I've been talking to soldiers, both ranks and soldiers um, over the last couple of days. And I can tell you they are honored to do this with us. And that is why it gives me great pleasure to spend extra time letting them know just how grateful we are. So while I know your, your sentiments may come from a position of sympathy, thinking of our men and women on the board that they live for this and they're very, very deeply honored to do this for us. And we're very grateful. Great. Thank you so much for that. I was actually going to ask you for your part in remarks there, but I don't know if I should take that as it, or if you want to add anything else, um, basically. So uh, there are, there were a few questions in the chat, but I can, I can tell you that some of the questions were actually similar to what was answered or would have been answered in the presentations of the ministers. So if you're still interested in having any conversation on those questions, please feel free to contact us outside of this um, meeting and we'll be sure to uh, provide that answer. I can assure you on previous webinars, we've had people who contacted us even after the webinars would have finished. Email us or WhatsApp with some questions. We provided the answer for them and they also asked for recordings you know, of the webinar because it was so informative. You can find those recordings on our Facebook page, Dice for a Unit, as well as our YouTube page uh, where they're uploaded um, to, uh, to if you want a, a copy and to, to get more information, like I said, authentic official information on the Guyana of uh, Venezuela border controversy. I, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedule um, to attend these sessions here. We chose Florida as a separate um, uh, an engagement because we know that there are lots of people, there are lots of people in Florida who have an interest in Guyana. And so we thought, you know what, we'll have a separate engagement for them so they can ask their questions. And I want to implore all of you, there are lots a fair mongering out there. Social media could be a dangerous place sometimes. And perhaps with the ability and so many apps that give people freedom to create content, you have to be careful. Like whilst people were concluding, I was getting a Twitter um, account of a video of something that says, you know, fighting is taking place in the border. It turns out to be something in a different country. And there was a disclaimer that this is from a different country, but they used the two names, Guyana and Venezuela. So I'm like anybody who is not understanding of the issue We'll see that and already start panicking. None of these things are true. So we have to be very careful. And I think that would be 
some of the gen the genesis behind some of the questions relating to is it safe to travel to Ghana? It is very safe to travel to Ghana. There has not been a decrease in any of the flights or even the, the passengers traveling on these aircraft. So I can tell you business is happening as usual. The government is fully um, in control of the situation using all necessary uh, tools that they have to make to prepare for any eventuality. We cannot predict what the future holds, but I can assure you every step and measure is being taken to and, and, and taking everything into consideration. We live in a very volatile world. We understand that. And the most we can do is prepare and trust God that the worst does not happen. Same thing in aviation. You spend millions of dollars to, uh, to ensure the thing, you know, the aircraft is safe with the hope that nothing happens. And this is the same thing that you can put it uh, politically. The government is taking every step in diplomacy, in engagement of different authorities to ensure <clears throat> we have things in place and still hope that nothing happens. So we, that's the best we can do. Again, I would encourage you to follow official sources from the government of Guyana for your information on the border issue. And should you have any question or doubt about anything, there are no shortages of people on the ground in Guyana even through our honorary council, you can feed him the question, he can feed it to us, where we can give you the official, the government's official position on these matters or the answer that you seek. So that being said, again, I want to thank you for being here. We appreciate you and we will continue to engage you on any issue that relates to Ghana. We are we're grateful for your interest in Ghana. Never mind, you're in a different country and we want to keep the diaspora updated and informed. We have our contact details that's in the chat box. You'll see this blue uh, kind of purple flyer with all of our details, please feel free to reach out to us. That, um, and if you don't want to put your con your contact information publicly, there's a way that you can message somebody here privately on the chat box so we can get your information alone. All right, thank you so much. Um, God bless you. And ministers, thank you so much. I can just imagine what your days and nights are like with this here. I was telling somebody today, I think you must be dreaming this issue as well because you know there's so much to talk about, so much sensitization program and you are all everywhere uh, speaking on behalf of the issue to our to people to enlighten them all in the interest of service to your country and we really value you and appreciate you for that dude, and taking time out from your busy schedule to be here and i know the diaspora also is very grateful to you for all of that again thank you and even as we end this and we go off the call we are still going to keep the chat open so that people can put their information but in a few minutes we're going to completely take off everything so thank you again have a good night everybody god bless you take care Thank you very much and good night to all our viewers and I hope that the program was helpful. Stay safe and stay in touch and connected.